All right, so today we are going to go over our uh, second actual lecture, continuing on with statics. All right, so uh, just to review what we've gone over so far is we've gone over vectors, we've gone over the parallelogram, <coughs> uh, law of sines, law of cosines, um, resultants, and resolving a vector. Okay, <coughs> today we'll talk about the equilibrium of a particle, we'll talk about moments, and then we'll talk about equilibrium of a rigid body. Okay, <clears throat> so when we talk about equilibrium of a particle, what we're talking about really is <clears throat> the equilibrium of a particle means, you know, the particle is not moving. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when we sum forces, they equal zero in all directions. So if we had three force vectors or four force vectors as shown here, um, they could be coming, you know, in plane, they could be coming out of plane. And when uh, the sum of forces in each x, y, and z direction of each force component has to be equal to zero and also the sum of forces are equal to zero. <clears throat> so this is the particle here and the particle has no real area but it has a mass so we're treating it as a point mass. So when we talk about equilibrium of a particle we're really just talking about the equilibrium of this mass. There's really no moments on a particle. It's the main point there. Okay. Now when we talk about static problems, there are some components that we use to uh, transfer forces or components that are proportional to uh, displacement, uh, where the force is proportional to, to displacement, like a spring. Okay, so uh, the first component we'll talk about is a pulley. Um, say we have a pulley here, and this pulley has a tension in the cable, and the tension in the cable if it's a static problem, has to be the same for both sides. Otherwise, the uh, one side would move relative to the other side. So when we talk about pulley, the tension is the same on both sides. When we talk about springs, we say the spring has a force that is proportional to the displacement. Okay. <clears throat> so when we have a spring, we say the spring is, delivers a force that's proportional to displacement. So right here, the displacement is zero. That's the spring in its uh, unstretched state, and uh, the force is zero. But if we apply a force on the spring, an external force, there will be a force that's in the opposite direction, resisting that external force that's proportional, that's k, that's the proportionality constant, to the distance. Okay, so if we apply a force, we get a force that's equal and opposite, and it's kd. <clears throat> okay, so we can use these concepts of the uh, particle equilibrium and uh, pulley and spring and put them together to solve some simple static problems. Okay, so in this problem, um, you know, we may want to find out uh, how can we keep this... Uh, spring a certain length or how can we keep uh, the distance between the pulley and the mass a certain length or something like that. Okay, So what we do to solve these types of problems is we uh, cut the lines here and we treat each um, each component separately. Okay, So what we could do is we could uh, take the mass and we can cut this line here and if we cut this there's a force that wants to pull the mass down and of course the tension in the cable that keeps the mass from moving okay, and a static problem that doesn't go anywhere so this is the free body diagram for the mass free body diagrams are going to be used throughout this class and they're very important and um, they allow us to um, treat different sections of a problem <coughs> excuse me and identify the forces so we could look at the if we cut here and we cut here, we can find the free body diagram. It's just the tension, okay? So we have this force here that's due to the weight and this force here that's due to the rest of the cable keeping this section from uh, falling out. And again, uh, we have this notation. This is the force from E to C, okay? And this is the force from C to E, okay? Uh, we can look at the, the knot in the cord right here. <coughs> and uh, cut it here, cut it here, and cut it here, and then we can look at the equilibrium here. So by cutting these, it allows us to open up these forces, and because it's a static problem, then they all have to balance out. 
So the x component of this force here has to be equal and opposite to the x component here. The y component of this force has to be equal and opposite to this force here. So that's how these work. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, we can use this to solve some simple problems. Here's an example. Uh, find the tension in the cables AB and AD for this given problem. Okay. So uh, we're told that there's a weight of 2.5. 2.452 kilonewtons. Okay, this might be like an engine hoist or something like that. And that there's an angle of 30 degrees <clears throat> from the horizontal for the chord AB. So the way that we solve these problems is we can sum the forces in the x direction and the y direction. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll take this point and we'll treat this like a particle. Okay, and because of particle equilibrium, uh, the sum of forces has to be equal to zero. So we can look at this tension in the wire from and wire that goes to B, and the tension in the wire that goes to D, and the weight of the uh, particle. So if we just sum the forces here at this point, then we have TB, which is the tension of B times the cosine of 30. That gives us the X component minus TD, which is the force that's in the opposite direction equals zero. Okay, and then we have TB times the sine of 30, and that gives us this component right here, minus 2.452 kilonewtons equals zero, and that's minus this. So this force, which is a component of TB, has to be equal and opposite to this force. This force, which has to be equal and opposite to this component of TB, um, they, they have to be the same. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, if we do that, we get two equations, and we actually have uh, one unknown. Sorry, there's two equations and two unknowns, so we don't know TD and we don't know TB. So the first, the second equation here gives us TB. So we can say TB sine 30 is equal to 2.45 kilonewtons, or TB is equal to 2.45 kilonewtons divided by the sine of 30. So when we do that, we find that TB is 4.90 kilonewtons, okay, and then we can plug TB in here, okay, in the first equation. Here's equation one and equation two. And when we do that, we find that uh, TD is uh, 4.25 kilonewtons, okay? So this is an example of how we use particle equilibrium to identify forces and using free body diagrams. So this is the free body diagram of this joint here, okay? And we summed forces, they had to be equal to zero. Here's another example, okay? You can determine the required length of chord AC. That's from here to here. So that the eight kilogram lamp is suspended in the position shown. So what they're trying to say is what length does this have to be so that this is perfectly vertical and you don't have any sagging here. Okay, the undeformed length of the spring AB is L prime AB is 0.4 meters. And the spring has a stiffness of KAB equal to 300 newtons, okay? So they gave us the undeformed length and they gave us the stiffness so that when we look at the deformed length, we can find out um, how much how, I mean, how much force is in the spring, okay? We have this tension here, there's, there's going to be some force in the spring that's to the right. So we'll take a look at this clasp here, the center clasp where everything comes together, and we will um, identify our forces that act on that. We'll treat this as a particle. We'll do particle equilibrium. We'll draw a free body diagram. Free body diagram shows us how what forces are acting on the particle. And then <clears throat> we can look at um, how they balance out. So they tell us it's, it's an eight kilogram lamp. So we know that the weight, the force due to gravity is eight kilograms times 9.81. Okay, that gives us 78.5 Newtons. That has to be balanced by TAC sine 30. Okay, that's this Y component of TAC. When we find that out, That'll, that'll tell us what TAC is, and when we find TAC, we can find TAB. Okay, so if we sum forces in the x direction, they have to equal zero. Sum forces in the y direction, they have to equal zero. 
So we get the tension TAB, and recall that's this TAB, that's, that's the X component in this direction, and that's positive because we said that right is positive, minus TAC cosine 30, and TAC cosine 30 is this part right here, and then we have TAC sine 30, which is this part, and that has to be equal to uh, the weight, and which it is. Okay, so TAC is in the positive y direction. The force due to gravity is in the negative y direction. When we sum them, they have to be equal to zero. So this says that TAC is 157 newtons, and that shows us that TAB is 136 newtons. Okay, now that's the tension due to the spring right here. So if that's the tension in the spring is 136 newtons, that has to be equal to the that's the force in the spring. Well, this, that force has to be equal to the spring constant, K, times the displacement, okay? So if we take 136 and divide it by 300, that shows us that this length is 0.453 meters, okay? Now, remember that the undeformed length of the spring, up here it says the undeformed length of the spring was 0.4 meters. So that's the length of the spring uh, the nominal length um, without pushing on it. Okay, so we automatically get 0.4 meters worth of spring without pushing on it. Okay, the rest of that force becomes beca comes because we deformed it an additional 0.453. Okay, so we have to add those up. That gives us 0.853. Okay, so the, the answer to answer the question that tells us if this here is 0.853 meters, then this distance from C to A, just X distance has to be 2 meters minus this distance, okay, or that's <clears throat> um, 2 meters minus this distance gives us the length of the spring times the cosine of 30, okay, so it's the, this length times the cosine of 30, okay, so that's how we would identify this length. So I encourage you right now, if this is confusing, uh, there's a couple different concepts that have been introduced here, the undeformed length, the deformed length of a spring, you know, using a free body diagram, doing particle dynamic, uh, particle um, equilibrium. So we have particle equilibrium, we have deformed and undeformed lengths. And if you're weak on your trig, then uh, you may uh, spend a couple minutes, pause the video here, and go through this example on your own and make sure that you understand what's going on. Okay, so in addition to um, forces, summing forces, uh, bodies, um, um, rigid bodies also experience a moment, okay? We don't usually talk about moments on a particle because a particle is treated as a particle. It has no um, geometrical identity. It's just a point in space, okay? And in order to have a moment, you have to have a force that's applied at a distance, okay? So a moment is a force times a distance, and this is pretty much how we represented it. If we have this distance here, D, and the distance is from the center of this, um, <clears throat> from this uh, rod all the way to the end, that's your distance D, and we apply a force F, then we get a moment here about the center point here. And the moment is, is, is a force that causes a tendency to twist. <clears throat> so typically in statics we talk about moments, and moments are <clears throat> the tendency to, to twist something. In dynamics, we talk about torque, but they're the exact same units. They're a force times a distance, but f torque usually causes an acceleration. A moment is a static uh, thing that, that wants to cause a system to bend or twist. Okay, but they, they're identical. Moments and torques are the same. It's just in, when we talk about statics, we usually use the term moment which is a force applied at a distance that causes a rotation about that center point. Okay, and we talk about dynamics, we usually talk about torques because they cause accelerations. Okay, now 
We define a positive moment by the right hand rule. Okay? So that means if you took your right hand and you placed it along the distance D and you curled your fingers in the direction of the force, if your thumb is pointing up, you know, because you can only curl your fingers one way, if your thumb is pointing up, we'd call that a positive moment. Now in this case right here, we have, this is the distance, so I would put my hand, my right hand, pointing from the center out to the force. Uh, so in this case, uh, it would be like this, and then I would curl my fingers towards the application of the force. So this would cause me to curl my right hand uh, to the left, and that means my thumb is pointing in the up direction. So that would be a positive moment. Now let's say, for example, that the force was in the opposite direction. If it was in the opposite direction, okay, then when I then in order for me to curl my fingers in the direction of the force, I'd have to have my right hand upside down, which means my my thumb is pointing down. So then I would have a negative moment. Okay. <clears throat> when we talk about moments, sometimes we uh, talk about uh, couples, okay, and a couple is a pair of equal and opposite parallel forces, okay. So, you see here we have a force applied at d over 2, so that gives us this moment, okay, and if I were to use the right hand rule here, then this points, I would point my fingers along here, and I would curl them in the direction of, that the force is pointing, which means my thumb would be pointing into the screen, and over here, that makes it this positive. And then over here, I would point my right hand along here and I would curl my fingers in the direction of the force. So that means my thumb would be pointing into the screen as well. I'm going to call that positive for both these cases. So this is a couple that's applied to this. And so you might experience this like maybe when you're driving. This could be your steering wheel, this could be one hand, this could be another hand. <coughs> Excuse me. And when we turn the steering wheel, you know, we, if we, you know, turn it one way or the other, we're, we're applying these, you know, forces that are in this equal and opposite direction to turn the steering wheel. Well, that could be also found just by uh, doing F times D, okay? It's the same uh, amplitude, okay? So if you have a couple applied at some distance, D over 2, then you could also look at it as a moment F times D, okay? So a couple is just a pair of equal and opposite moments, okay? So that's the moment of a force. So let's look at some different ways just to identify the magnitude of a moment in some basic figures. Now, the key here is when we talk about moments and we talk about the distance to the force, we're talking about the perpendicular distance, okay? So if you go back here, this is the, perp the force, the distance that's perpendicular to this force. This distance is a distance that's perpendicular to this force. This distance this is a distance that's perpendicular to this force. Okay, so this is these are some examples to, to illustrate this. Okay, so let's say I have a bar, and I want to know what is the tendency of this force to twist this bar about this point. In other words, what's the moment of this force about O? Okay, and that's right here in Figure 4:4a. And that would be 100, that's F, okay, times 2. And it would be in the clockwise direction. It would be 200 Newton meters. Okay, Newton meters is the uh, unit of <clears throat> a moment. Now if we go to figure 4.44b, which is this guy here, now we want to know what is the tendency of this moment, I mean this force of 50 Newtons to cause this point to twist. Okay? Well, in this case, we don't take this distance 2 because uh, this 2, this distance here, and this uh, vector are parallel. Okay? So we have to take the perpendicular distance from this point. And this perpendicular distance to this force line is 0.75 meters. So we would multiply 0.75 times 50. That would be 37.5 newton meters. And again, the tendency of this force would cause this object to twist, to turn in the clockwise direction. Okay? 
Now, <clears throat> let's look at C. So now we have a 40 pound force and we want to know what is the tendency of this force to cause this to move. <clears throat> and again, we just want to look at the perpendicular distance. So we'll take four feet plus, if this is the hypotenuse of this right triangle and it's two feet, this is two cosine of 30, this distance here. So we say four plus two cosine of 30 times 40 <coughs> gives us that in those moments. Okay? And notice this is in pounds and feet. Okay, this is the U.S. unit of moments, and that's 229 foot-pounds. Okay, now what about figure 4.4D, this here? Okay, so if we look at this figure and we have this moment applied, okay, we just take the perpendicular distance. Okay, the perpendicular distance between this force and this point is just this distance here, or if this is three feet and this is one foot, then one times the sine of 45 degrees gives us this distance here and that is multiplied by the force of 60 that gives us 42.4 foot-pounds okay one more example here at the end say we have a moment here and we have this force applied here and the question is what is the tendency to cause this to move and this is going to be the perpendicular distance which is 4 minus 1 which is 3 okay 3 times 7 okay so 3 times 7 is 21 kilonewtons kilonewton meter okay so this is how we do moments this is how we analyze moments that are applied to rigid bodies okay if we have a moment in three dimensions um, <clears throat> and we have unit vectors i j and k and these are just the directions along the x y and z axes and we have the distance to the, the x distance to the <coughs> force, the y distance to the force, and the z distance to a force. And we have the force resolved in terms of fx, fy, and fz, which are just the x, y, and z components of a, the force vector. We can use the determinant <coughs> to identify uh, the moment in three dimensions. Okay? A moment in three dimensions is beyond the scope of this class. But what I can show you is that if we had it in three dimensions and we had RZ is zero and FZ is zero, then we have just the planar case. So if FZ is zero, this goes away. If RZ is zero, this goes away. We don't have any moment along the I direction. If RZ is zero, this goes away. If FZ is zero, this goes away. We don't have any moment about the J axis. And the only thing we're left at is rx times fy and you see rx is the distance to the perpendicular force component of that force vector minus ry fx is that force vector <coughs> times the distance perpendicular distance to that force vector vector and this is in the k direction and if you look at this these are all in the k direction so this is if we had this is x and this is y we say that this tends to twist, and it twists about this third dimension, which you can't see, but it's a direction that's into the plane of the screen. <clears throat> Here's another example. The force F acts at the end of an angle bracket. Okay, this is a rigid body. Okay, it's not a particle. So because it has a geometric length and height, then uh, it can su sustain a moment or uh, forces that cause it to rotate. Okay, so the force F acts at the end of the angle bracket shown in this figure. Determine the moment of the force about point O. So if I have a force here, the question is, what is the tendency of this force to cause this structure to twist about this point? Okay, now based upon our previous discussions, you should know automatically all you have to do is take this force, resolve it into its X component, Okay, and then multiply it by the y distance, and then resolve this force into its y component, and then multiply it by its x distance. Okay, so we do just that. We say 400 times the sine of 30, that gives us this x component times 0.2. Okay, and that causes this to rotate in, in this direction, in the counterclockwise direction. Okay, and if we define counterclockwise as positive, which we can define it any way we want, 
that's what's done here and says this little arrow here shows that we're saying this is counterclockwise it's positive um, then this would this x component of the force in this direction would cause this to spin or go in counterclockwise direction so we say it's positive and then we have this y component of the force here times that x distance so it's 400 times the cosine of 30 okay that's this component of the force in the negative y direction times 0.4 okay so it's not minus because it's in this direction it's minus because we've defined a force that causes a rotation in the clockwise direction to be negative okay so if we add these together this gives us 98.6 newton meters we could all do what we could also do this using a cartesian vector approach okay and we can look at the force and position vectors in terms of 0.4i minus 0.2j is the dis is the vector from here to here okay and all this says is it's 0.4 at i 0.4 units in the i direction and i is the unit vector in the x direction like we talked about previously and then we have minus 0.2 meters in the j direction which is in the uh, y <coughs> y axis okay so un j is a unit vector in the y direction so if we say 0.4 times i that means we go 0.4 in the positive x direction if we say minus 0.2 in the j means we go minus 0.2 in the j direction that gives us to this point here that's the also the vector from o to this point right here this is the r vector and so what we can do is take this F, <clears throat> okay, the F is 400 sine 30, okay, that's this component, and that's in that positive x direction. We have minus <clears throat> 400 cosine of 30, and that's the component of the force in this direction. So the, the, the moment is the cross product of these two, and I showed you earlier a couple slides ago that we can use this um, cross product, and because the K term, because there's no uh, direction in the there's no force in the z direction at at a distance and there's no uh, force in the z direction there's no um, force or distance to that force in the z direction they, these are both zero so that means when we take the cross product which is just the determinant of this um, matrix when we say i j and k are just the unit vectors then all we have to do is look at the um, two by two determinant of these two, which is 0.4 times minus 346.4 minus 200 times 0.2. Okay, and this is in the k direction. And then the k direction is the direction that's out of plane. Okay, that's our k vector on the z axis. Okay, so this is another way to do it. So uh, the first solution here, this is called scalar analysis say scalar analysis this solution here is called vector analysis I encourage you to pause the video at this point and just jot down this problem and make sure that that you understand this if you don't understand this then in the next class make sure that you raise your hand and we can uh, talk about it in more detail um, when we draw free body diagrams of rigid bodies we we pick different components to to tell us uh, to, to show how forces are acting on the body. Okay, you might see something like this, some uh, component of a body with a little ball under it, and all that just means is that the, the forces are only in the up and down direction. When you roll back and forth, there's no force to uh, resist that motion. There's no forces that are transmitted in, in the X direction. Okay, for this one or this one. There's only forces that are normal to the surface or just in the y direction. Okay, so that case can be represented by this diagram or this diagram or this diagram or this diagram. Okay, so what that says is like if we have a, a rigid body that's on a surface, the only forces from the surface are in the normal direction. And normal is just the positive y direction here. Okay, so it can only go up. Okay, if we have cable tension in a cable, let's say something like this, this can only support tension in this direction. Okay? So there's only there's only force in this direction. Okay? You can't have force in this direction because the cable wouldn't support that. It can only support tension. Okay? Same thing here. 
okay? Because if you push this, these, this, these two pin joints tell you that it'll rotate. So if I try to push it in the X direction, it'll just rotate, okay? But if I try to go in the Y direction, then, then I'm going to cause a tension to be in this link right here, okay? So over here on the right, uh, this uh, this shows you how to find the reactions, okay? When when a body touches another body, okay? So if you can, and there's uh, nine steps, okay? So I encourage you to read these steps, okay? Some other reactions, if we have a frictionless uh, shaft or collar, okay? So it can be represented by this. And what this says is that there's only forces uh, normal to these rails because we'll say this is either a well lubricated uh, um, shaft or it's um, you know it's frictionless okay so either you have uh, components that slide uh, with respect to each other or you have components uh, that have a, like very little friction okay same thing over here if you have a collar okay um, and here you say that there, there's no force in the x direction again there's only force in the y direction okay over here this is a beam it's hard to see the left hand side but if this is uh, fixed that you push a force here or you push a force over here you actually can get two forces you'll get a force here in the x direction and in the y direction you'll get a force in the x direction and you can also get a moment okay so if you have a fixed support beam, you can get a moment. <clears throat> if you have a hinge or a surface that looks like this, then you can have um, friction in the x direction, okay? And you can have force in the y direction, but you can't have a moment, okay? So these are some things that you'll see uh, throughout the semester when we draw statics problems, okay? So, <coughs> uh, here's uh, our last example problem. It says a bracket is subjected to forces and a couple shown. Determine an equivalent force couple system or a force moment system to be applied at point A. Okay, so here's point A. Angles here are measured clockwise from the horizontal. A clockwise moments are positive. Forces upward and to the right are also positive. Okay, so the question is, and this is taken from your FE book, this might be something that you'd see in the FE exam, but this is uh, what they what they want you to know is basically we have all these forces acting at all these distances, what what, is, what does A experience? So all we have to do is sum the forces in the X direction, sum the forces in the Y direction, and then um, we take the magnitude of those forces, which is just the x direction squared and the y direction, I mean y x force and y force squared, gives us this force. Okay, that's the force at A. So if we, you know, ha uh, pin it at A. So this is 200 minus 3 fifths times this. Okay, and 3 fifths is a simple way of just looking at this. 5 is the hypotenuse of this. A uh, little triangle, so it's a three, four, five triangle. So if I do three over five, that gives me the x component of this force. If I do four over five and I multiply it by 150, it gives me the y component of the force. So that's just a little shortcut. Okay, so we have 200 minus three over five minus 200 minus three over five times 150. So those are the components of the force in the x direction. And then we have forces in the y, so it's 4 over 5 times 150 in the negative direction, so it's negative 150. And then over here we have positive 150, okay, and that leaves us with 30 newtons. That's how we get this force. Okay, now this force acts at an angle, which is inverse tangent of the y component of the force over the x component of the force that gives us the angle, okay. And because this force is in the negative direction, we add 180 degrees to it. Okay, so that's the clockwise from the horizontal. Then we can look at the moments, okay? So this is the moment. We're going to take this force and multiply it by this distance. We're going to take this component of the force and multiply it by this distance here. And then there's no component of the force here because they're in the same distance. And then we're going to just add this moment here, and then we'll add 
30 times 150 and apply it here. Okay, so if we do that, we get minus 200 times the distance to that force, the perpendicular distance, that's this part, minus 150, okay, that's this force times 0.3 meters, that's this distance, okay. Okay, and these are both, these both make, uh, want to make it move counterclockwise, okay, we've defined clockwise as positive, so these are going to both be negative. Okay, and then we take the last part, which is uh, 4 fifths times 150, which gives us the Y component times 0.15 meters, okay, minus this couple here, this, this couple here, or this moment here, which is applied um, to the whole system, which causes it to rotate, which causes it to want to rotate. So if we add all those up, that gives us minus 103 Newton meters. So essentially we're saying, oh, we can sum all these forces and effectively just add up to show that there's one force effectively at, at A that can be represented by 292 Newtons at 186 degrees with a positive horizontal axis and a moment of 103 Newton meters. Okay. So this lecture has been um, just an overview of some uh, basic components and uh, particle equilibrium and then um, some rigid body um, force sums and introduction of what a moment is. Okay, so make sure that you understand these examples uh, here in this lecture and if you have any questions uh, just ask.